Erin Austin Abbott is here. She is an author and photographer. This book is called Small Town Living, a coast-to-coast -coast guide to people, places, and communities. It is from Running Press. You okay with, with that thing? I think so. Yeah, I'll come over here and do something. <laughs> I'll ruin it. Uh, it's a celebration of the joys of small town life. Publishers Weekly, an idyllic celebration of the rural life. And it is, it'll make you feel good about small town living, something I believe everyone in this room knows a little something about. Y'all please welcome Aaron Austin Abbott. We're in big trouble when I'm touching anything, <laughs> electronic or otherwise. All right, uh, this book, I was, uh, was reading it and I thought, man, how did first one of the first things I thought was, how did you sell this book? You're with a big time New York publisher and you went in to propose this book. How did it, how did the pitch go? Well, so as a writer, as soon as one book is out, you're already thinking of your next one. Yeah. So I kept going back and forth with my agent and she was like, What's your next book gonna be? And I was like, I really just want to write about small towns. People kept coming to me and asking me how I found Water Valley, how I found Oxford, um, and what what living in a small town was like. All these questions just kept popping up, and I kept realizing that, you know, with the pandemic, you people were learning how to work remotely. They didn't have to be in big cities to have the creative life they wanted or the career they wanted. They could get into a smaller place, and I wanted to help show the pros and cons of what that is. Now, for your research, you did a lot of driving. I did, I did. You don't, you don't just get in a little flight and fly off to these places, you drove a lot. I drove a lot. My uh, son and I hopped in the car for, I guess, about four months. <laughs> and I took all the photos for the book. We covered wow. 18 states in the book, but drove through 28 in the process. Man, so you would do, you would go off on weeks at a time and come back home and sort of read? Exactly. I was gone impressed. for, you know, about two weeks, come back for a day or two, be gone for another six weeks or eight weeks, come back for, there was one flying, we did fly to Utah and then drove to, through Colorado um, and then flew home and then six hours later I did fly to Seattle. Oh, so, <laughs> Seattle. Yeah. Like, wow. And th so those are the two flights I took for the book. So it's interesting, even before the pandemic, but especially after, during and after the pandemic, people, small towns started looking attractive to people in big cities. Absolutely. People were looking to, you know, make a change, slow down, realize that maybe they could have their big city career, but in a remote setting somewhere outside of the city and there wasn't a book like this so there, there I took really it on. Is. Yeah, uh, I was amazed as I read, read along and just the sheer amount of work you put into it because you not only give uh, a lot of lists, they all love lists in these kind of books. They do. Best place to get uh, small towns for healthcare, culture, whatever it might be. Uh, but you, you also included personal stories. You went and interviewed people. I did. Uh, so that, that uh, and you went to all four, we had East West, so I wanted to ask you a couple of quick, yeah. quick hitters. Uh, Stu Eli and Janet Morales from Media, Pennsylvania, weird name. Uh, they, they, their aha moment, the reason they wanted to downsize and go to a small town, they got tired of carrying their baby up and down stairs. <laughs> Simple as that, right? I mean, that's all it takes sometimes. I'm tired. Of, I'm tired of this building we're living in. I think it was a five-story walk-up in Brooklyn. Please. Yeah. I mean. I would get tired of that. Yeah. And so they, they had they sat down together as a couple. What are we going to do? And they narrowed it down to what the, their dream jobs were: either open a hamburger stand or a stationery store. <laughs> they opted for a stationery store. Yeah. They went with a stationery. Yeah. It's also sort of a vintage. Stores kind of well thought of in that it's, in it's big a, time. It's a great shop. It's probably one of the best stores I've been to anywhere. Three Potato Four is the name of it. Yeah. All right. Uh, Laura Cap, uh, Ashland, Nebraska. She um, 
she remembered she wanted to bring some cookies home and took a detour to the baker and what happened to there was an empty storefront next to the bakery or actually the bakery uh she um she she really liked the building and came back a while later and it was empty and decided to open up a store just like that yeah just she like just that. loved the the bones of the building because we think of it as being these great epiphanies but it can be now she has a cafe bookstore she does around. she has a coffee shop and yeah. ashlyn surprised me i was i you know nebraska you 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 don't really know what you're going to find and I was very pleasantly surprised. With Ashley Nebraska, yeah. because there was like anything there at all. You don't know. Yeah, no. Hold your cards and letters, Nebraskians. I'm sure they're all huddled around the radio out there. Uh, Hannah Carpenter in Searcy, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. She's an interesting story. Uh, I love the line. She wanted her kids to learn how to drive in a place that was not terrifying. <laughs> So, it's a no Oxford place. for her, right? <laughs> yeah, not no Oxford for her. But it is a college town. Um, yeah. But I guess it's less terrifying. And that it's just these sort of moments that it's not these grand epiphanies. You're sitting in traffic one, one day and you go, I'm, I'm ready to move. It can be that easy. It, you know, we had a neighbor who um, in Water Valley who bought the house two up from us. He didn't live there very long, but he moved to Water Valley because he got tired of Wait, he stopped, he was at a stoplight and he had to wait three times to get through the stoplight. And so he decided to move from Houston, Texas to Waterbound. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it takes. Yeah, you don't have that three, three stop line, stop sign thing there. I think we only have one stoplight. <laughs> I was going to narrow that down for you. Or we have two, sorry. Yes, please, thank you. Don't add that third one or there goes your charm. Right? Yeah. Don't want to get stopped there. Uh, I love uh, Joanne Holly McBride. She's from uh, Skagit River Valley, Washington State. She had a health scare. And I would think that's a very common occurrence. Somebody, you have a health scare and you go, man, I'm, I'm rearranging. Once you come out of it, you know, recover. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there could be you know, an older parent that you need to take care of, or for her, she had a health scare and needed to be out of city pollution. Oh, and yeah. it was a lung situation. And now, as her we life mentioned, is thriving. Yeah, and, and that, I'm sure that's so very common. As we mentioned, it's uh, so many, a combination of things why people want to do this uh, move to a smaller place. And you have great lists all in the book, as we mentioned best place for healthcare, but best place for hiking and nature, whatever your interest may be. Uh, but you also don't pull any punches. And you mentioned when you go to some of these small towns, uh, the internet may be spotty, or you, you're, the doctor may be an hour away. Um, yeah. All true. All true, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's important that as building these small towns, and if you're, you know, we live in one, but if someone were to think of moving to one, you know, how to make it a more inclusive community for everyone that lives there. Like, what, what does your town need that, that could really um, help your community be a better community for everyone? Yeah, and you have many, many suggestions of what you can do when you come to a community. Maybe a church thing, maybe your school, volunteer, get out there and whatever's going on and join. Yes. And, and you mentioned you joined all these a lot of different things when you got to water valley and some things didn't even exist you didn't have an arts council down there maybe there wasn't an arts council um the the um the the um the art crawl was new oh, right, um, right, right. you know that was new after i moved there but um yeah there's lots of things that that it's we've seen a lot of growth in water valley specifically but i mean you've got i love the suggestions you oh, have for yeah. people who when they do make the move yes. the way they yes. can assimilate into into a small town i'm going to get out of your way like i know you want to read a minute but i can't leave without asking you about the great creskin y'all remember creskin the mentalist he'd be on whatever show and he would read he would read your mind and tell you what you had a run-in, if that's the word, with Creskin. It was something interesting. Uh, I happened to be in the audience, and it was over the lyric, and Creskin was doing his thing, amazing us, but you're kind of thinking, well, they probably got together before the show, and you know, Creskin worked it out. 
Then he started talking to you. Tell us about your interaction with Crispin. And this was my only interaction with him. I had never met him. And he asked Are you me, sure? I'm, well, I probably did after you hear this story, but I don't remember it. Okay. <laughs> but we, um, he asked us to write someone close to us the initials and put it in a sealed envelope under our chair. And I wrote T.O., who is the initials of my son. And he has a, not an unusual name, but it's somewhat unusual. Um, and Kreskin stood up and he said, who's Tom Otis? Oh. And most people, you know, well, maybe their names are Thomas, but he's actually Tom. And Kreskin said, who's Tom Otis? And I was just like, that's my son. And he's like, where is this child? And I was pregnant with Tom at the time. And I pointed to my, my belly and like, but for him to get Tom Otis so specifically, like, you know, we were, we were chatting a little bit about remembering that story. And I'm like, he could have picked Thomas Oliver for all we know, you I, know, but like Tom Otis, it's so specific. I, I could tell by your response, it was legit. <laughs> Y'all had not, cause you were floored. We were all floored. Yeah, we okay. were. I just want to get that straight. All right, but you should have put Kreskin in the book, by the way. That would have been. Does he live in a small town, though? Well, but you had your... <laughs> he guessed, I have my criteria. You came to a small town and guessed Tom Otis, and that's, that's enough for me. Uh, again, y'all, it is Small Town Living. It is from Running Press. Let me make sure we, I know somebody had to think long and hard on your subtitle. A coast-to-coast -coast guide to people, places, and communities. Aaron Austin have it, y'all. So I want to make sure that this goes out to Mary Lou. She was one of the first people to welcome me to Water Valley, and so this is definitely for her. Uh, this is my small town journey. As a child, I lived in Oxford, a small town in North Mississippi, until around fourth grade. In 1985, we moved to a different small town, about 25 miles outside of Tampa, Florida. Living so close to a large city like Tampa was very new to me. The town I moved from was only around 5,000 residents, if you can believe Oxford was that, um, at the time. Land Lakes, Florida wasn't much bigger than Oxford, but its proximity to Tampa made it feel vastly different. There weren't as many amenities in Land Lakes, so we traveled to Tampa for most of our needs, which made it feel like an extension of our home. We moved to St. Petersburg, just over the bay from Tampa, after three years in Land Lakes, and I found that over time, I forgot what small town living was like. I spent my 20s bouncing from one city to the next, Tampa, Boston, Seattle, to San Francisco, to Memphis, New York City, then back to Memphis. Growing tired of the day-to-day, -day, the fast-paced bustling from place to place, living out of a bag when I needed to be gone all day for the grind of city living, I knew it was time to make a change and get out of the bubble I found myself in. My cost of living was so high, forcing me the kind of spending that would help would, that would never help me see my goals come to fruition. I knew it was time to start looking elsewhere. As, and I, as I had this aha moment, I dove into looking for a small town. I needed my small town to be within an hour from a city, near an international airport, near a university with a good live music scene, and the ability to evoke the same feeling I had for the small town we had left when I was just nine years old. The eureka moment came when I realized that I could move back to the small town I had left as a child. Oxford had seen a lot of growth since then, though, so I looked a little further out. I bought my house in January of 2005 in Water Valley, Mississippi, just 15 minutes from Oxford, and just a little over an hour from Memphis, Tennessee. For only $65,000, I got a beautiful folk Victorian built in 1890. The cost of living in Water Valley also afforded me the ability to move to a new city for a few months out of the year, if I so chose. I moved to Water Val uh, excuse me, I moved to Los Angeles for a short time early into my residence in Water Valley, but I have been grounded here ever since. When I decided to move to Water Valley, I didn't know how to find the essential things like a plumber or a realtor. I didn't know how to meet people or get involved in my community. I wasn't even thinking about schools because at the time I was single and schools weren't even on my radar before I became a mom. 
Since then, I've thought about all these things plus about a hundred others. I lived in some of the world's most desirable cities, yet I still landed in a small town in rural Mississippi. Why? What drew me here? Better yet, what keeps me here? And what does it look like to raise a child in a small town? Water Valley, Mississippi is charming and attracts many artists escaping the high cost of living in cities. They are able to be full-time working creatives here. Its proximity to the University of Mississippi in Oxford makes it appealing as well. There will always be growth in college towns and property investments will typically always pay off with a constant influx of people moving to the area. Having grown up in Oxford and seeing the ways cities grow and change as neighborhoods become desirable and sought after, I understand the growth that it's ex it has experienced. More and more people began to move to Oxford about 25 years ago, and I saw the expansion toward Water Valley as the next logical direction. I knew it was time to hang up my big city hat and head somewhere where my ideas could make a change instead of continuing to live in the progressive bubble of each city where I had resided. That doesn't mean the work happening in cities isn't wonderful and very much needed, because it is. For me, though, it was important to feel that I could bring something new to the table without that. I was left with the idea that I was interchangeable in my social justice and creative work. I wasn't saying anything that hadn't been said before, and it was starting to affect me. I knew that I personally needed a different environment to thrive. Thank you. out front after the show visit and sign copies of small town living that's something we all know something about uh, and maybe take it for granted sometimes but uh, again we were saying another one of the reasons you, you hear about was people just wanted to see stars again you ever see stars in the sky yes yeah, so we uh, man and by the way what a beautiful day y'all brought with you here today thank y'all so much you, you took the humidity and just hit it somewhere I don't even know where it went but we're going